I guess we're on. Okay, so a couple of bookkeeping items to take care of before we start. Monday is a regular teaching day for me, so it's a regular work day for me. So I will be in my office hours from 2 to 5 o'clock in the library, as always. Uh, so if you want to come to office hours on Monday, I will be available because it's a regular work day. Tuesday, exams begin. So Tuesday's office hours are not going to be uh, available to you. If I'm in my office and you come by, no problem. But don't expect me to be there because I don't actually have to be at work on Tuesday. I probably will be, but if I'm not there, uh, don't be surprised. My advice is to call first, okay? I'm almost always in my office, even when I'm not supposed to be. But, snooze, never heard anybody, right? So call before you just show up on Tuesday. Monday, regular day, I will be here. Uh, also, evaluations for this class are online, so please go online and fill that out for me. I'd be very appreciative. Any constructive criticism is helpful. Anything I'm doing right is uh, also good to know. Anything that you need more of, that you'd like to see me do more of X, Y, Z, that would be very helpful too. I do take student evaluations very seriously. Okay? Other than that, let's get back into material. Now, last time we talked, you put my, well, my wires are back, man. What am I going to do? I know, I'm too short. It sucks. This is so embarrassing. It's on TV, it's on YouTube now. No, I'm like too short to even move these wires out of my way. Thank you, I appreciate it. I wish I was a little bit taller. I wish I was a ball. If I had a phone and a girl, and I would call her. Who knows that song? That's an old one, right? Yeah. But that was cool back when I was cool. Yeah, you're all laughing because you know I was never cool. All right, last time we were here, we talked about... So... And that was a good lead-in to violators. So this is kind of what SOAP will do. These are called my cells. Now, I'm not an expert on the biology of cells, but I do know a little bit about it. I know it's similar to my cell. So this is what they call my cell. Don't worry too much about that name. Just know that when you dissolve soap in water, <coughs> All the hydrophobic all the hydrophobic tails will blend into each other. Okay? So that area where all the hydrocarbony tails come together, there's probably no water in there. That's a very oily environment. That area in here is what's used to dissolve oils from your clothes and skin. This area out here is hydrophilic. Water loving. These have ions. These are negative. So they're polar. Water is also polar. So polar things like to dissolve into polar things. So water will be on the outside of this. So water's out here. No water in here. Or shall we say very little. There it is in. Okay? So that's kind of what soap will do and stuff like that will do. But now you want to move this theory and move it into the cell membrane. Now the cell membrane is almost the same thing, except for instead of being in a three-dimensional sphere-like structure, it's going to form a bilayer. Now what do I mean by that? Let's see if we can pull some information up here. Come on, work for me the last day. Last day, you just work one more day and I let you go. Nope. Well, we'll be doing a lot of water. Oh, oh, hey, wait now. Like, just got picture things. Okay, lipid bilayer. <coughs> Write all these little points down. The lipid bilayer contains proteins, carbohydrates, and cholesterol, or another lipid. The second point, unsaturated fatty acids that make the cell membranes fluid-like rather than rigid. Fluid-like. Interesting. Let's talk about that in a few minutes. Has proteins and carbohydrates on the surface that communicate with hormones and neurotransmitters. Hmm. That's interesting. What would that be? Oh, we'll get into that in a minute. Just write all that stuff down real quick. So we can all be on the same page of what's happening here.
So I drew a little drawing. Now, what I'm drawing here is I'm trying to represent the lipid bilayer. On the top, we have some fatty acid type thing. So these little circles, they represent the polar head or the carboxylic acid, the negative charge, the carboxylate anion. These little lines here, I'm representing the, the uh, hydrocarbon tail. So just like we had before, we had this. I only drew one tail, now I'm drawing two just because it's more fun, I guess. This has a head that's negative and a tail that's hydrophobic. These tails don't want to be associated with water. They want to be associated with other hydrophobic things. So what they do is they stack onto each other like this. And the tails from these carboxylic acids and these ones start to intermingle. Now I've drawn them nice and neat, lined up like soldiers. That's not at all how they're going to look in reality. In reality, they're going to be intertwined and tangled into each other. It's going to be pretty, uh, not rigid, but a pretty strong little environment. We all know that they're, you know, the lipid bilayer must be pretty strong because we're all here. Okay? If the lipid bilayer wasn't strong, our cells would fall apart. All the internal workings would pour out. So this, the lipid bilayer is a pretty tough little layer. Now you can damage it very easily, but it is pretty tough. So on one side of the lipid bilayer, is the environment outside of the cell. On the other side of the lipid bilayer is the inside of the cell. So it's a pretty closed off area. So the inside of the cell, pretty closed off. But now, if you read this, what you just wrote down, you'll see the lipid bilayer contains proteins, carbohydrates, and cholesterol. That's the first point. Go down to the last point, proteins and carbohydrates on the surface that communicate with hormones and neurotransmitters. That's interesting. Hmm. Let's think about that for a minute. Let's just draw a little line here and put sugar. Let's put a little line there and say sugar. Now we, we stop the line at the surface here. I'm going to fix that in a minute. We stop the line at the surface. So the sugar is covalently bonded to the surface. It's right there. <coughs> Excuse me. So how does that do anything in here? It's way out there. Somebody got a text. So now, what could be happening, there's many mechanisms for this, is this could be penetrating all the way down through the cell. It could be a long chain of sugars here. Or other things that put something else in here. Say another sugar. A different sugar in there. Okay? So we have a sugar at the surface, along perhaps a carbohydrate, perhaps something else, that goes all the way down to the inside of the cell. So now this is still closed off. Whatever's out here can't get in here, but now something can, say, bind to that sugar, say an enzyme, can come up to that sugar and bind to it. Well, you know yourself, right? Take your hands and you know, kind of flail them around, right? Now, what if someone comes up behind you and binds to you? Now you become a little more rigid, right? When you do that, your conformation or your body shape changes. You're like, you go from being kind of fluid to being, oh, crap, stiff. So, so someone binding your shoulders sends a signal all the way down to your toes. Your whole body ridges up, right? Molecules are very similar. If something binds to the sugar out here, it's in the water, it's flailing around, doing some kind of motion. Something binds to it. Makes it, say, more rigid, for example. That would, send a chem that would send a shock wave down through here and will actually change the sugar in here. Not change it chemically, but change it uh, dynamically. So instead of it being you know, fluid and moving, maybe it changes. Maybe instead of turning slightly to the left, it turns slightly to the right, and that's all it takes. Okay? So now, this sugar, instead of being, say, turned off, gets turned on. Say it gets turned in the right direction so that other enzymes can bind to it now. So a signal from the outside of the cell has made, it, it's made, has made its way inside of the cell just by binding to the sugar at the surface. Does that make a little bit of sense? Mm -hmm. Now you always hear that, right? You guys have heard this before. Chemical messengers. It sends a chemical message to the cells around it to do something interesting. Do you ever wonder how the message got there? Synapse. What's a synapse? A um, neurotransmission. Yep. You ever, but 
but you're assuming that, don't always assume that whatever chemicals get sent out get taken into a cell. They usually don't. They usually get bound to the surface. And the proteins on the surface, or the, or the carbohydrates, the receptors, get bound to. And that will send the chemicals and shockwave down through the membrane into the cell. Usually, drug, uh, usually hormones don't get drawn into the cell. Sometimes they do, but not always. Sometimes it sits at the surface. Now, why is that good? It's fast. To bring something into the cell takes time. Something to bind at the surface is quick. It's fast. So if it's binding at the surface, it can go all the way down to inside the cell, right? Yes, well, the signal does. Yeah, okay. It binds here, and it sends a shock wave, perhaps, down through this, this uh, uh, carbohydrate, for example. It, could, it doesn't have to be a carbohydrate, it could be a protein. But it sends a chemical signal by, by changing the structure slightly of this carbohydrate. So all it has to do is just change the structure. There's lots of examples of that. Okay? Now that's one way to send a chemical signal into a cell. There's numerous ways. Okay? So you understand what I'm saying so far? Mm -hmm. A little bit? That's like a quick and dirty and really broad stroke biochemical lesson right there. Really broad stroke. But that's all it takes in this class. Don't write this down, just follow along. As you can see here, this little diagram I'm trying to sh uh, is showing you the lipid bilayer a lot better than I could do, of course. But let's take a look now at some of the things that we see here. We see carbohydrates at the top there. My laser not working. Yeah, my little control seemed better day. You see the carbohydrates at the top, as I've kind of drawn them there. You also see these weird protein things that are kind of going through the membrane. See that? See that one here especially? Yeah, can't do it. Sorry. See the one that looks like kind of like a coffee bean? You know? Has like a hole drilled through it. That's interesting. Let's tune to that. Write these three kinds of transport down. Transport through the cell membrane. Diffusion, facilitated, and active. Three, well, three main types of movement of materials through a cell membrane. <coughs> Excuse me. Diffusion, things just kind of go from a lower, uh, high concentration to a low. That's just diffusion. You all know that one. Facilitated transport. Uses protein channels or holes. This is a protein that kind of bore a hole through the cell membrane. The little ions or molecules can find that orifice and go through it. A lot of times those uh, proteins that drill a hole through your membrane are gatekeep. There's a little gate on that will open and close depending on the chemical environment. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not getting sick. Active transport. Now that active transport is when you move ions against the concentration gradient. So now instead of diffusion, you're actually forcing ions into a cell where there's already a high concentration of ions for whatever purpose the cell may have. All right, so those are your three main types of um, transport. Transport, I'm trying to transport through the cell. And as soon as you get that done, we'll look at a little picture and we'll be done with chapter 15. The uh, cellular biochemistry is probably the most fascinating field, I believe, in chemistry. It's a very difficult field, uh, but it's fascinating once we can figure out how stuff works you know, at the chemical level. Not, not at, the, at the biological level, where they make, uh, I would argue, broad strokes. You know, they say Golgi complex, and that's like supposed to be the be all and end all. For, for a biologist, it usually is, but for a chemist, we like to understand how does a Golgi complex do what it does. And me, I was always interested in chemical signaling. How does a hormone signal to the inside of the cell to make more protein? Fascinating. I think so anyway. Maybe you do not. Are we okay so far, guys? Slow writing. Go a little quicker. So I want you to get to chapter 16 where the prize value is double. Thank you for whoever you were that laughed. Diffusion, you just randomly things get across the membrane. 
facilitated transport, there's a protein that actually opens a hole in the membrane to allow things to transport through it. And active transport is when you're pushing against the gradient, so you're pushing either uh, stuff into the cell or out of the cell. And notice beside that little drawing, there's a little thing that says ATP. That's an energetic uh, transport that takes energy to do that. So you can't just do it by a passive diffusion. That is an energetic process. Pretty neat, huh? All right, so that was unit 15. We're going to move right into 16. Okay. My favorite chapter. Chapter 16. Proteins and peptides and amino acids. Proteins, peptides, amino acids. These are fun. Now, you've probably all heard the word protein before. You've probably all heard the word amino acids before. You may have even heard the word peptide. You may even have heard the word enzyme. Now we're going to define what those things are. And then they show a big old cow with big old horns. Kind of cool. Horns are made of protein. That's why they're showing it. Right. Can we remote controller? One more? Two more hours. There we go. And then you can duck. Okay. Write some of this stuff down for me. Wait, proteins. There are 20 of them. Sorry, not proteins. Peptides, amino acids. There are 20 of them. Every protein, every enzyme, every peptide in your body is made up with the 20 amino acids we have. Now, there are some that are different than the 20 that are uh, considered natural. There are a few of them, but they're uncommon compared to the 20 natural ones. So they don't really get listed, but they do exist. So don't think there's only 20. There's many more than 20. They have different characteristics and functions that depend on the order of the amino acids. So now, think of it this way. You have 20 individual puzzle pieces. So there's, just take 20 puzzle pieces that all fit together. So they all will fit together. It's not like a cool puzzle where only certain pieces fit together. All 20 will fit together. So now you can put, and let's just say this. Let's just do this little exercise in your, in your mind. Put all 20 puzzle pieces in your mind. All 20 will fit together. Now number them 1 through 20. Now. You could line them up 1 through 20. You could line them up 1 through 10, 20 through 11. You could line them up 15 through 20, 1 through 15. You could line them up, basically I'm trying to get you to understand this, you could line them up in a bazillion different ways, right? Because there's 20 of them. So let's say you line them up 1 through 20. That's one protein. It might do one function. It might just give cellular legit rigidity. It might just make things rigid. Let's take that first amino acid, let's take it off the front and put it on the back. So now you go 2 through 20, and then the number 1 is attached to number 20. That's a completely new enzyme, or a new protein. That protein may not even be able to be rigid. It may be completely water-soluble. You don't know. Let's take number 1, instead of having it on the end, let's put it in the middle. So now you go 2 through 10, number 1, 11 through 9 through 20. You just change it again. Making those little minute changes can drastically affect the structure and the function of the protein or the enzyme. Drastically. I mean, it might kill you, kind of thing. There are proteins in our bodies. They're called the cysteine proteases. Cysteine's an amino acid. If the cysteine is not in the exact right place, you will surely die. Very, very bad death. Okay. That's how important that is. Now, if the cysteine is in the right place, that's good, depending on what's happening to you. If you're having a stroke, that's bad. But if you're actually trying to grow and survive, that's a good thing. Okay, and they perform many different functions in the body, blah, 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 structure, transport, biological reactions, all kinds of stuff. They do all kinds of stuff. But now, let's talk. Let's talk about amino acids. For this class, we just say it's anything. There's a few things that, well, there's nothing that R can't be, but there's a lot of things that R is not. 
But for this class, we'll just say it's any old thing. Okay? So now, this, this structure right here is the base structure of all amino acids. They all follow that sequence. NH2, a CH with an R group attached to it, and a carboxylic acid. All right? This functional group right here is called amine. Right? NH2 to the amine. Over here, this is called a carboxylic acid. So this particular molecule has two types of compounds associated with it. It's an amine on one hand and a carboxylic acid on the other. So it's got like a duality thing going on here. On one hand, I'm an amine. On the other hand, I'm a carboxylic acid. Take your pick. Which one do you want? So now, knowing that, knowing that there's an amine on one side and a carboxylic acid on the other, you don't want to go around saying, you know, if you go to the nutrition store and say, hey, do you have any amine carboxylic acids? It doesn't roll off the tongue very well, does it? But that's what you could say. You'd be right. An amine carboxylic acid. We don't say that. We truncate it down to the words amino, which comes from here. Amine, just change the E to an O because it sounds a little better. Acids. Carboxylic acid. See where the name comes from? Amino acids. Okay? So now when you go to the store, the GNC or wherever you go to buy your supplements, you know what you're buying. You're buying amino acids. You're just buying these types of things. So far so good? Yes. Everybody? Okay. So now, I'm trying to follow along the slide as best I can. I can go off on a tangent here if I I better not though. I'll try to stay on top of it. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Go to the next one. Come on. There we go. Good eye open. I have been told when I talk about proteins and peptides that I go off on all kinds of crazy tangents. But I used to study these. As a, my career was always involved in uh, proteins and enzymes. So I can go off on all kinds of crazy tangents and drug discovery and all that. So I try to stay focused. Sorry. All right. Zwitter ion. Write that word down. Zwitter ion. Now, Zwitter ion, that word's easy to remember. Why? Because it starts with a Z or a Z. And not many words start with Z or Z. So, Zwitter. Zwitter ion. Basically, a Zwitter ion, how I define a Zwitter ion, is any molecule that has a positive and a negative charge contained therein. Okay? Now, that doesn't make much sense right now. Let me just draw it. So now, in a Zwitter ion, That's neutral. It has a plus and a minus, so it's neutral. But now instead of the atoms being neutral, this nitrogen has a positive charge, and that oxygen has a negative charge. Okay? Over here, we don't see that. This nitrogen doesn't have any charges. This oxygen doesn't have any charges. So this is not a Zwitter ion. This, though, is. The nitrogen has a plus charge. The oxygen has a negative charge. That's a Zwitter ion. The plus and the minus are contained on the same molecule. Not to be confused with a ionic bond. Ionic bond are two separate things coming together with pluses and minuses. This has the plus and the minus in the same molecule. Okay? Now, let's examine this closely, shall we? <coughs> let's look at the nitrogen. The NH2 on the left, the blue NH2. Let's just look at that. Everybody look at it. How many hydrogens are there? Two. two. Let's go to the right, to the red nitrogen. How many hydrogens are on that nitrogen? Three. Three. Now, let's think back. Let's think back to the chemistry of acids and bases. What's an acid? Okay. Okay. Oh, someone said it. What were you going to say? They'll donate a proton. You said the same thing. Very good. Acids donate protons. Right? Proton donors. What's a base? 
acceptor. Right. So an acid donates a proton, a base accepts a proton, right? Everybody? So if we're going from here to there, what happened? It accepted one proton. So that's a base, right? Everybody agree that's a base? That makes this a what? There it is, conjugate. If it's a base on this side, when it becomes a Zwitter ion, that's a conjugate acid. Right? Very good. Now, let's look at here. At that oxygen right there. That oxygen has how many hydrogens attached to it? One. Over here, that same oxygen, which is right here, how many does it have attached to it? None, right? So the hydrogen went somewhere, didn't it? It went to the nitrogen, probably. So that this oxygen right here is a acid. Because the proton was here, and over here it's gone. So it's a proton donor. You with me? Okay. So this is an acid. Which should have been given away down here, right? This functional group is called a carboxylic acid, so that's an acid. Okay. So this is a conjugate base. Now that's weird and cool and interesting all at the same time. I know it seems like a very minor thing because you know at this level you're just trying to keep your feet wet, but that's amazing. That's awesome. Because of this phenomenon, you have an acid and a base in the same molecule. Pizza Hut. Now, you have an acid and a base in the same molecule. That's phenomenal. Why? First of all, you can dissolve them in water. That's the first thing. You don't, you don't know this because you probably haven't thought too much or haven't been exposed to too much. Most amino acids aren't soluble in water. If you put them in a certain type of solution, like a neutral water, most of them won't dissolve. For those of you who have ever taken supplements, have you ever taken a pill and broke it up, put it in water? Unless they're specifically designed to dissolve in water, they usually don't. That's weird, right? Because we're mostly water, right? That's strange. But now, you take them and put them into the right kind of aqueous environment, say an acidic environment, this is a base, right? So if you put this molecule into a strong acid like your belly, that's going to donate a, like, to the proton, right? Like the, your belly is an acid, it's going to give protons away. That's a base, it's going to accept them, right? It's going to become positive. Kind of like salt, sodium chloride, soluble in water. That'll become positive, soluble in water. Big deal. Big deal. Because if it wasn't soluble in water, we couldn't, we couldn't use it. Yet very few chemicals that our body can use when they're not in water. Oxygen will be one. But we dissolve it like our body will dissolve it itself. So, kind of weird, huh? So that's the Zwitter ion. Everyone kind of okay with that? Again, I go off on tangents. I just contain myself. I get all excited about like, oncoal proteins because they're so freaking fascinating. And they're big and they're gnarly. <laughs> yeah. People get mad respect you can make. All right, so all amino acids are chiral, except for glycine. Remember chirality, left hand versus right hand? Yeah. Remember that? So they're all chiral. The Fisher projection, remember that? You write the, remember that? Yeah, anyone? Yeah. Uh, you can if you want. I'm just going to kind of blow through it. It's not as important as something we're going to talk about here in a minute. So don't write anything down. I'm just going to blow through it. Okay? One thing you need to know all the isomers, all the natural isomers are L. So now, you can write this down. This is a little bit of a consumer report here. When you're in the market for amino acids, which a lot of people do because they're bodybuilders or whatnot, when you're in the market for amino acids and you go to General Nutrition Store, you may have seen DL amino acids. It may also be written as positive negative amino acids. Less commonly, you'll see RS amino acids.
they're chiral. Amino acids are chiral. So just like sugars, you can have a left and the right hand. Amino acids, you can have a left and a right hand too, or also. Now, read very carefully at the very bottom. In proteins, all L isomers, no D isomers are found in proteins. So you don't need the D isomer. You can't, most of the time your body can't actually use it. It can't process it because it's the wrong hand. So what happens to it? You get very colorful urine. And very expensive urine too. Okay? So when you're in the market for amino acids, if you see this, DL plus minus or R and S, that means you have 50% of one, 50% of the other. Okay? That's what it means. So if you're paying $30 for a couple of kilos or whatever they charge for amino acids and it says D and L, you're only getting half of what you're paying. You might be better off paying a little more for the all natural one, which will only have one of them in it. Okay? Just so you know, maybe you don't care, but kind of save you a dollar. Usually the ones that are not mixtures are more expensive because it's harder to get usually. Okay. Here we have two examples of amino acids. Let's look at them closely. Remember when we did the stereochemistry D and L of sugars? Remember when we did that? Go all the way to the bottom, jump up one carbon, look where the oxygen is, if it's on the left, it's L, if it's on the right, it's D. Amino acids are just as easy. Check it out. Go all the way to the bottom, the bottom carbon. Jump up one, bam. Where's the nitrogen? So it's L. How easy can it get, right? Follow sugars. Same as a sugar. Is that cool or what? So if you want to assign D or L to an amino acid, look at the structure, go down to the last carbon, jump up one, look to the left. It's on the left, the nitrogen, sorry, the nitrogen's on the left, it's L. If it's on the right, it's D. What does D stand for? rotatory. You didn't think I'd know. Aha. And the L stands for lever rotatory. It's, uh, I believe it's Latin for left and right. For, because when you do these things, I, I don't want to get too hard into this. When you look at these things in the lab, you use a machine, and these things have the ability to take light and turn it in one direction or another. Don't worry about how. So if it turns to the left, it's called lever rotatory, or turning to the left. If it goes to the right, it's called dexter rotatory, or turning to the right. So it's fancy. Sorry, I was a little bit more than you need to know, but I told you I'd get excited. <laughs> Okay, so that's all there is to that D and L stuff, okay? Just so you know, don't forget that. Whenever you go to like GNC or Walmart or wherever you buy your supplements, look for that. You'll see this all the time. You'll see this a lot too because people don't know what it means. Uh, a lot of times marketing, they try to confuse you. So they put plus minus because it looks kind of cool and high tech. Uh, that just means it's a mixture of 50-50. You'll see vitamins like that. You'll see amino acids like that. And you'll see sugars like that. Uh, that also means it's probably synthetic. Uh, I'll just guarantee you it's the best. Okay, come on now. Here we go. Side chain. So now, this is cool. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is why amino acids are so powerful. We haven't mentioned it too much yet, but now we're going to talk about it. The R group. The R group. So let me drop an amino acid here. So I already told you, and I hope that you agree with me, that R can be anything for the most part. R can be anything for the most part. So now if we're going to talk about side chains, we can classify them as three different types. Polar, or sorry, two different types, and there's a whole bunch more inside of these. Polar and nonpolar. Now, I'm going to give you a simplified way of knowing. There are a few exceptions to this rule, but I'm not going to try to trick you with the exceptions. If your side chain has anything in it except carbon and hydrogen, you can bet it's polar. There's a few exceptions, but for the most part, that's true. So if your side chain, so if R equals uh, carbon and hydrogen only, 
then it's nonpolar. If R equals carbon and hydrogen and oxygen or sulfur or nitrogen, uh, that's about it, then it's polar. There is an, there's an exception to this rule, so it's not a hard and fast rule, but uh, for this class, it's a great rule. Okay? So, if R, the R group, this little dangly view here off the bottom, if it has carbon and hydrogen only, only, nothing else, then it's nonpolar. If it has carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur, then it's polar. Let's look at these two structures here. The top one, or the one, excuse me, the one on the left. Let me just uh, draw it here. There's one of them. So now we're going to look just right here, just in that circle part, just on the circle part. Just look at the circle part. Don't worry about the stuff on top. Just the circle part. You will notice that that side chain contains only carbon and hydrogen. Is that true? Yes. So that is a nonpolar side chain. Okay. Remember what we talked about? We talked about the uh, soaps and the lipid bilayer. How you had the long tail, and that tail just had carbon and hydrogen. Remember that? And we said that that tail hates water, hydrophobic. Remember that? So if that's true, if that long tail hates water, can't stand it, what do you think this is? Does it like water or does it hate water? It hates water. It hates water. No, hates a strong word. Aggressively dislikes. Okay? So it doesn't want to be in water. It would prefer to dissolve into oil. Like your fat or like other hydrophobic things, just like soaps would do. They would kind of blend into each other, right? Now, look at that arginine. No, asparagine, oh cool, asparagine. Right, did I get that right? Yes, I did, good. So there's asparagine, let me draw a little meter. There we go. Now, just focusing on the circle part. Again, notice this top part and the top part here are exactly the same. So all we care about is the bottom part, so the R group. In this R group, do you have other atoms besides carbon and hydrogen? Yes, yes you have nitrogen and oxygen, right? So that R group is polar. Now, remember back to soaps. We had the hydrophobic tails that would kind of intermingle, and we had the negatively charged heads that stayed and kind of hung out with the water, right? Because they're hydrophilic. They love water. So what do you think that R group's going to do? Is it going to dissolve into water, or is it going to dissolve into fat? Water. It loved the water. Give me a big water hug. It's wet and sloppy. Okay? Loves water. Everybody okay with that idea? Nonpolar, polar. Hates water, loves water. Nonpolar, doesn't want to be near water. Polar, wants to be near water. Okay? And that's, it's really that simple. So here, don't write these down, just kind of follow along. Here are all your nonpolar amino acids. Now, I'll show you the exceptions. Here's an exception. Tryptophan is considered nonpolar, but it does have a nitrogen stuck in it. Methionine has a sulfur in it, and they're both, uh, they're both considered nonpolar, but don't worry about those two, please. I will not trick you with those two, okay? If I ask you if it's polar or nonpolar, it will follow these two rules written in red, okay? However, for classes that are coming up in your life, you may want to put those into your memory banks that methionine and tryptophan are nonpolar, okay? For reasons that I'm not going to talk about in the class, all right? So, nonpolar, they love being dissolved in anything but water. And here are your polar ones. Now notice all the polar ones have carbon and hydrogen 
but they also have oxygen or sulfur or nitrogen, sometimes more than one of them. These are your polar R groups. They love water. They want to embrace it and make it their own. Like that cartoon. I want to hug you and kiss you and put you in a cage someday. Isn't that kids? No? Looney Tunes kids? Never saw that? Yeah, so they the like... yeah, something like that. That's a long time ago. You gotta go get some Hulu in your, in your life and catch up with your cartoons. Just kidding, I don't have Hulu. Too, too cheap. Alright, there's also acidic and basic. Write these down. Acidic and basic amino acids. We're only talking about the R group stuff. We're not talking about the uh, core structure. Acidic and basic. Okay. All right, acidic ones. What do we got there? Sparic acid? Let's do glutamic acid. Yeah. single bond to OH. This thing right here. Let's just point it out with a black arrow. There we go. That functional group is called a carboxylic acid. So that functional group is known as a carboxylic acid. So that amino acid side chain has a carboxylic acid built into it. So if I were to ask you, is this amino acid acidic or basic, you would say it's acidic. Why? Because it has a carboxylic acid built into it. Okay? Make sense? We're not worried about the skeleton. We're not worried about the, the blue part, just the red part. Okay? Does that make some sense? A little bit? All right. Now, another one. Uh, oh, histidine. That would get complicated now. All right, here we go. Let's draw the histidine side chain. Holy oh, crap, it's been a long time to sit on that. Double bond that way, okay. And nitrogen that way. Okay. Yes, there, okay, good. And that one. Now, the, the basic ones are a little tougher to tell. They're a little tough. I'm going to give you a little trick. Acid ones are simple. If there's a carboxylic acid in the side chain, it's an acid. Those are easy. The basic ones are a lot tougher. So here's a little trick. And I, it always works. Let's just say for this class, it always works. If there's nitrogen in the side chain, basic. There's an exception to that, but don't worry about it in this class. If there's a nitrogen in the side chain, it's basic. Okay? Nitrogen loves to be basic. So if there's a nitrogen in the side chain, the amino acid is basic. Okay? Now, both of these, both of these, this one and that one, are polar. They're both polar. 
but they're further classified more specifically as acidic or basic. They're both polar though. They certainly are not non-polar because they have atoms that are not carbon and hydrogen. Make sense? But they're further subdivided into acidic and basic. Now I know, I know, you guys are all thinking this is silly. Who cares? Who cares how we classify amino acids? You do. I do. Because our bodies rely on this. Let me ask you, is this a, it's a silly question. It's a silly question. Let's say, let's say, this acid here and that base there came together and reacted. So the proton would go from one atom, one molecule to another, right? An acid base reaction. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I don't want to do this with on time. This will be fun. So let's have you guys and you guys all stand over here. Come on. Now. You want to come too? It'll be fun. Come on. Come on down. It's going to be funny. Watch this. Now, this is going to be kind of a silly little thing we're going to do here. But believe it or not, it's going to tell us a lot. Everyone stand in the front and hold hands. Face the audience. Though. And don't worry. Don't worry about the camera with the red light on. Now, everyone. Everyone see the musical Rent? 5,000? No, never mind. <laughs> Where are you guys doing? Come on, come on. Come on, come on. We need you. We need you all. Now, I know this seems a little weird. You got people up here holding hands. But trust me, it's going to make sense. Everybody here is an amino acid. Everybody. Everyone's an amino acid. Okay? Now, I'm going to say you are the acid, the acidic amino acid. So I'll have that just hold it in your hand. You guys can still hold, like, hold her wrist. There we go. Now, she's got the hydrogen. This is the proton right here. Okay? Now, I'm going to say that you are the base. Okay? Make sense so far? So now, can you guys move your hands around? Is it pretty easy? See how easy they can move? Can you kind of come this way a little bit? The stretch. See how they can do that? Oh, go back or contract. You guys do the same thing. Stretch and contract. See how much freedom of movement they have? Now, they can move down here and they didn't move over here. So they're kind of, not really, but sort of independent of one another. See what I'm saying? So now, you're acidic. She's basic. And you guys are flailing around. You're moving in solution. Enzymes and proteins do this. You guys, uh, it's going to be a little hard because we don't have a lot of room. Let me make some room behind you here. We're going to do a little trick. And amino acids do this. This is not simply for fun in my entertainment. So they're moving. Now you guys follow me. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. Okay, now they're folding. Look at that. They're folding onto each other. This happens. Okay, straighten up. Straighten up. You come over here. Okay. Okay. Whoa, okay, stop. She's a base. Right? We have our acidic proton has come into close proximity with our basic amino acid. Are you with me? So you guys come around here. Now, they will react. Okay, just a little bit so they can see. This lady right here and this lady right here, an acid and a base will react. Yeah, get that proton. Yeah. Okay, you took the proton. So now she has a proton. Okay, stay right there for a second. We have done a proton exchange. One person had the proton, now they've given it to somebody else, right? So now, somebody's a conjugate acid, somebody's a conjugate base, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's positive, somebody's negative, right? Mm -hmm. What's that called? Ionic bond, right? Mm -hmm. Sodium chloride, they make an ionic bond, right? Mm -hmm. That's a really strong bond, isn't it? Remember sodium chloride takes a thousand degrees or so to melt it? This isn't quite that strong, but it's still strong. Now watch this now. You guys are going to come close together now. And nope, oh, stop right there. See, they're now positive and negative. They're interacting. They don't want to separate from each other. Why? Because they're positive and negative. They're like, oh, this feels so nice. But look what they did to the backbone. See what they did to the backbone? The whole amino acid structure, instead of being linear, has folded over onto itself. You see what I'm talking about? Enzymes rely on that. Proteins rely on that. They fold it over. Instead of being linear and boring, now they've come back to themselves. And now they're, they're interacting. Okay? That's one type of interaction. 
There's numerous, there's five that you're going to learn about today. Okay? That's called a salt bridge. You have a plus and a minus close together. It's called a salt bridge. That's a very strong interaction. This protein or this little peptide here will stay folded for a long, long time until you eat it up or something. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So keep this little demo in mind when we're learning about protein structure. Okay? Round of applause for my really cool volunteers who are nice enough to volunteer to do this. Thank you guys. Appreciate that. Now, I do that demo because it's important and it's also fun, but it's important that you understand why proteins will fold. Okay, so now, now that we've gotten into folding a little bit, let's talk a lot more about bonding. Because we haven't really discussed, we will now. Come on. Come on. Alright, let's go over here and do this. Oh. I want to screw up some of that stuff. Formation of peptides. So write that down, formation of peptides. Formation of peptides. Now, I remember we had all these folks up here holding hands. And it wasn't because it was funny and we could laugh at them. But they were making bonds to one another. Now, when they were holding hands, that was a covalent bond. They covalently bonded to one another. That wasn't an interaction or some kind of weak attraction. That was a covalent bond, a physical connection. So when one amino acid decided it wanted to salt bridge with another down the chain, the whole thing had to turn. That's cool. That's important. And here's how it works. If two amino acids come together, so let's just take two simple amino acids. This is glycine, you don't need to know the names, but I'll just tell you this is glycine. Plus, I'm going to drop another simple amino acid, just a very simple one. Now I'm using simple examples because they're easy to draw and understand. All of them do this. Even the complicated ones do this. Okay, even the ones that are more complicated structurally, they still do this. Okay, so now, these two bad boys will come together. This is an amino acid, this is an amino acid. And what happens is this. Now uh, the color is important here, so please try to, if you can in your notebook, um, use color to help yourself understand this. Plus, um, yes. down real quick. I'm going to put a couple of uh, structural features here. That carbonyl group that's circled or squared off in red is right there. Okay? So the red, the squared carbonyl group on the left and on the right, that's where it is. It hasn't moved. It's just been bonded to something different. Over here, I'm going to circle this one now. That nitrogen that's in that circle is right there. Okay? So in essence, this carbon right here and that nitrogen right there have made a covalent bond. Don't worry about the mechanism and how the electrons are doing that. If they just do. Okay? One of the black protons, so here it has two H's on it, right? The nitrogen here has two hydrogens. Here it has one, and the other one went off as water. This is water. So that black hydrogen from this nitrogen, one of them, doesn't matter which one, is here. Now the OH from here is here. So you lose one molecule of water. So every time you make a bond between two amino acids, you get a molecule of water. Okay? 
Is that okay with everybody so far? Okay. I know it's a little weird, but that's what happens. So now, keep uh, sketching that out. I'm going to draw one thing underneath there. I'm basically going to redraw this right here. your classes of compounds, that bond is called an amide bond. Remember that? We talked about the classes of compounds. Amide was one of them, and I mentioned at that point, I think, I believe I did, that amide bonds were extremely important. And here they are back again, and here's why they're important. This bond here connects two amino acids. bond that connects two amino acids. That's important. Two amino acids. An amide bond that connects two amino acids. Now I'm making a big deal out of that. I've said it a few times, so I'm going to say it again. An amide bond that connects two amino acids. It has a special name. It's called a peptide bond. and in black, just so you can read it. That's why it's red, too. All right, I wrote it in three different colors, because it's that important. It doesn't go away. Whatever you Probably, I shouldn't say whatever, more than likely whatever field of study you go into, be it nursing, nutrition, yada yada, you're going to hear about peptide bonds. Why? Because our body depends on them to survive. One of the reasons we are here, one of the reasons that we don't fall apart, peptide bonds. Cool, huh? Peptide bonds. A peptide bond is an amide bond that connects two amino acids. Peptide bond is an amide bond that connects two amino acids. One more time. Everybody, a peptide bond is a? Amide bond that connects two amino acids. There it was. I love it. That's what it is. Now, you can have an amide bond that is not a peptide bond. It doesn't connect two amino acids. That's very common. Tons of examples of that. But whenever two amino acids are put together, that's an amide bond. More, more uh, specifically called a peptide bond. Okay, the word peptide bond should immediately your mind should go to amino acids, and immediately you should say it connects two of them together. That's what an amide bond is. Okay, now 
Notice how here, a carboxylic acid and an amine came together to make an amide bond, right? So that's what happened. In essence, a carboxylic acid and an amine came together. That's cool, right? What's this thing right here? That's an amine, isn't it? So what would happen then if another carboxylic acid came over here? It would put another one on here. It would grow. What if an amine came here? It would grow this way. So we made one simple peptide bond. But we don't have to stop there. We have an amine here. If another carboxylic acid comes from, say, a piece of steak that we ate, it could attach there. If another amino acid came from a piece of chicken, it could attach there. They grow. Okay? Your body is filled with these things. Pull your skin. You just pulled a whole bunch of amide bonds. Isn't that cool? You just yanked on. And they went. And then they went back. Because, you know, they're pretty tough. They take a lot of abuse. That's neat, right? Who doesn't think that's cool? Nobody. See, I told you. Always have a negative vote. But I've learned. Okay, so what's a peptide bond? Right, see? You already know it. Alright, uh, write this down for your notes. Levels of protein structure. Levels of protein structure. Now we're going to go back to that little demo I did with the people in the front. We're going to start talking a little bit more about that now. Okay. Let's first talk about protein. Peptides, proteins, and all that kind of stuff. We had, or we have on the board, two amino acids bonded together. You wouldn't call that a protein. It's too small. Proteins, I believe, I can't remember the exact number, but it's somewhere north of 50. 50 amino acids bound together, that's a protein. Now, a protein, and I'll write all this down for you in a minute, but I'm just going to say it now so we're kind of on the same page. A protein is a biological molecule that has a certain function, be it rigidity or something like that. Now there's also this word called enzyme. An enzyme is a protein. All enzymes are proteins. But an enzyme carries out a biological chemical reaction. Okay? So you have to have a chemical reaction. If you're an enzyme, you could do a chemical reaction. If you're just a protein, you can't do a chemical reaction. Okay? You're there for other biological reasons. You with me so far? Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Alright. So let's talk about that. Now, if we have a protein, remember we had the folks up here that are lined up from here over to there in a straight line. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a name, right? Mm -hmm. Or everybody still has a name, right? We could have named those people. We could have said, I don't I'm sorry if I put your name. John was here, Mary was here, Elizabeth was here, Karen was here. Russ is here, Jeff is here. We could have named them one after the other, right? Right? We could have done that, yes? Yes, yes everyone agree? We could have named everybody. That's called the primary structure. Write that down. Primary structure. Basically, I'm just telling you the names of the amino acids in order in which they appear. From left to right. So I would have started here on the left. I would have said, do John, Mary, Elizabeth, Karen, Paula, me, Jeff, James, you get the idea. Just name them all down the sequence. That's a primary structure. Okay? Now those things are interesting, but all they really tell you is what's attached to what. So James was attached to Mary, and Mary is attached to Jeff. That's all it tells you. It doesn't tell me that Elizabeth over here wants to wrap around and make a salt bridge with Karen. It doesn't tell me that. It doesn't tell me that. But I do know that they're there. I don't know how they're interacting, but I know they're there. Primary structure, okay? You may have heard, you may have heard uh, on some medical drama, they need to take a sample of someone's blood or DNA or what. No, DNA is not a protein, don't get me wrong. Uh, take a sample of something and they want to sequence Usually it's DNA, but DNA is not a protein. But you can also sequence proteins. What do they mean by sequence? They mean by primary structure. That's what they mean. When you want to get somebody's 
DNA sequence, it's not a protein, I don't, don't, get, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying DNA is a protein, but you can sequence them too. You're saying this amino acid, then this amino acid, then this amino acid, then this amino acid, that's called a sequence, sequencing. That's all they mean by that, it's kind of cool. At one time, sequencing was a big deal and cost a lot of money. Nowadays, it's pretty routine, which is kind of cool for science. Okay, let's take a look at this uh, little amino acid, or little peptide they've drawn here on the board for us. Now, if you look at this carefully, right here, right here, we have a peptide bond. Right there we have a peptide bond. And right there we have a peptide bond. Okay? So we have three peptide bonds in this little peptide. So now, if we wanted to, we could name all the amino acids that are connected in this peptide. And when you do it, you always start at the end side. The end side being the side that has a nitrogen. So this side here has a nitrogen hanging off part of the left. So you start naming it from here, and you go all the way to the end, where there's a carbon. That's called the C terminal. So the N terminal and the C terminal. So they're always written from nitrogen terminal to carbon terminal. They're always written that way. And then you just name off whatever the amino acids are. So the first one is alanine, the second one is leucine, cysteine, methionine. I'm never going to ask you to do that. I'm never going to ask you what is that amino acid. That's, that's beyond the scope of this course. But I do want you to be able to recognize in this particular peptide there are four amino acids. How do you know? One right there, one right there, one right there, one right there. There's four R groups. That's one way you can tell. Another way you can add up the peptide bonds and add one. So if there's 10 peptide bonds, there's 11 amino acids. Okay? That's sort of kind of okay, kind of sort. What's the primary sequence or primary structure? Sequence, right. Right. There you go. Start at the bar, go all the way to the end. All right. You don't have to write this down. I, just, I like to show this compound. Oxytocin. Anyone know what that is? Yes. What is it? It stimulates milk production. It stimulates what? Milk production. In pregnant women, yes. What else does it do? During pregnancy, it's released. Yes. Yeah. Why? To help um, with the pain. The pain? No. I don't pain. The contraction. Bonding. Yeah. Pair bonding. Yeah. Helps with pair bonding. Well, it actually causes pair bonding, I think. So when a woman is pregnant, she will release oxytocin into her system. Oxytocin is what binds you to your child. It was, it's what makes your mind go, I must look after this kid. It makes your mind say that. Because if you think about it in terms of uh, evolution, it's not a good thing for the woman to take care of children because it makes her at a disadvantage. Because now not only does she have to protect her own life, she has to protect the life of this child, right? The child's helpless, right? Mm -hmm. So your mind really should be like, no, 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 no. But it doesn't. It's like, oh yes, bring the child closer to protect it. Because your chemical in your brain, oxytocin, gives you the feeling of love. I love this child. Okay? Also, when men and women pair bond, this is what happens. Our minds get flooded with oxytocin. That's why men buy women flowers. <laughs> you know? It's true. When people laugh at that. It's true. It's been proven that oxytocin makes men more generous. It does. It makes us more generous. Is it like a bottle you can buy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is a place. You can make it. It's not that hard to make. But it'd be delivering it to where it needs to be would be the hard part. It makes men buy flowers. It makes women kind. Uh, it makes men want to pair bond with children too. Um, it's not it, so. It's not just a sexual love. It's a, also a, a family type love. Uh, so it makes you uh, it makes you more uh, nice. <laughs> cool, right? Oxytocin. So whenever you also, I believe, when you hug people, if you hug your children, it also uh, stimulates the release of oxytocin. I believe breastfeeding also does the same thing. I think it also passes from breast milk to child. I believe I read that somewhere. I have to look that one up. But if that's true, it would make sense because if you give oxytocin to your child while you're breastfeeding, it's going to be compared bond to you. But I don't have to look that one up. I don't, I'm not sure that's true. I've heard that. I'm not sure. Alrighty then. Let's move on to this next thing. Secondary structure. 
Secondary structure, alpha helix. Alpha helix. Now when you think about alpha helix, think about, well, we have to get a little old school here. Who remembers back in the day when cell, when, uh, cell phones weren't around and phones were connected to the wall? <laughs> you people, right? You people. Remember that phone cord that had the little curls in it? Yeah. You know, you could, like, had extra long ones. You go talk to your friends in your room, your mom couldn't hear. Mm -hmm. We've all done that, right? That used to be how we used to do it. Now, that little curly cue, that little curl, that phone cord, that is an alpha helix. It makes the thing just turns on to itself. Is that an idea? Is that what? Is that part of the DNA? Uh, yeah, DNA can do alpha helix too. Or dongle proteins. Proteins can also do Okay? Now, if you look at the backbone, the backbone is just the, well, let me draw. This is the backbone. the R groups. So the R groups are there, but the backbone doesn't refer to them. The backbone is just the amide bonds. Okay? So just consider the amide bonds. What happens in an alpha helix is as the protein or the sorry, as the protein turns, the amides, this oxygen here, will hydrogen bond to a hydrogen that's further away. Okay? I know it's kind of hard to visualize, but think of it like the little demo we just did when the people turn around onto themselves, it's kind of like that, only three-dimensional, okay? So it's the amide bonds that do this. They hydrogen bond to one another remotely, okay? It's kind of hard to visualize, but that's what happens, and it makes the protein turn, like the phone cord. All right, that's one type. There's numerous types of secondary structure. We're going to learn about two. Alpha helix is the first one. And beta pleated sheet is the second one. Now, both of these rely on the amide backbone. Both of them do. Alpha helix and beta pleated sheet. It's all about the backbone. It's all about the backbone. Okay, so far so good, guys? It's a little weird. This one's a little weird, I know. But so is beta pleated sheet. They're both a little strange. But you just kind of have to visualize it in your head. Hopefully, you guys can uh, do that. You have these peptide chains, right? There's a polypeptide. One more time. You have peptide chains, right? Yep. So one big long peptide or a protein. Huge mm -hmm. polypeptide just means many amino acids mm -hmm. or many peptide bonds. Fun, fun, fun. So far, so good, guys? I know it's just a little dry, but this is really how proteins act. Now, before we move on to the next thing, notice in the drawing, and I said it a few times, hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bond. Before we move on, let's discuss a hydrogen bond again, make sure everyone's on the same page. What's a hydrogen bond? Covalent bond? No. It's not a covalent bond. Okay, let's talk about the hydrogen bond before we move on so everyone's on the same page. Hydrogen bond. Water is the best example of something like a hydrogen bond. When you have A hydrogen atom bonded to a nitrogen or an oxygen. So it has to be nitrogen or oxygen. There are other examples of this, but just nitrogen and oxygen is where we're going to focus. We know the electronegativity of oxygen. Three point eight. Hydrogen, I think, is two point four or two point one. I think it's two point four. We know this less one point four. That's the difference between oxygen and hydrogens. 
electronegativity. Sound familiar yet? Okay. Yeah. So that means that if you look at a molecule of oxygen or a molecule of water, excuse me, hydrogen has a big delta plus, oxygen has a big delta negative. Remember all that? So water is polar. So now if another water molecule were to happen by, if another water molecule were to happen by, delta negative, delta positive, they're attracted to each other. They're not bonding, they're not actually physically connected, they're just attracted, okay? So like, me and you, for example, you're negative, I'm positive, delta negative, delta positive, I'm just gonna kind of come up to you and be attracted to, the, to your electronics, let's say, okay? That's a hydrogen bond. Now, if I'm not bonded, oxygen or nitrogen. So I'm a hydrogen, I have to be bonded to a nitrogen or an oxygen because they're left negative. Okay? Make sense now? Okay? So in terms of protein folding then, one of the hydrogens on the nitrogen, see how they're on a nitrogen? See that? See? So they're on a nitrogen. So say this one for example is on a nitrogen. This oxygen is delta negative. So, so hydrogen is in the backbone are gonna start looking for these kind of things, all right? And when they find one that they can bond with, or hydrogen bond with, or interact with, they will do it, and that causes the protein to turn. Does that make more sense? Yes. All right, because now you know what hydrogen bonding is. Hydrogen bonding, now beta pleated sheets do the same thing, only they force the structure into a different look. So we'll go ahead and scroll those two points down, and we'll show you a picture of one. One cool thing, the R groups are above and below. So on one side, the R groups are up. The other side, the R groups are down. It's all about the amide backbone, how they point to each other. Okay? And this is, all, this is all very abstract, so if you're not getting it right away, it's okay. Just uh, try to read the book and kind of get the grips with it. I'm trying to visualize it in your brain. I think it's pretty cool, but it's going to take a little bit of time for you guys to catch on to it. Don't worry about it. You have a week. It's not that hard, it's not calculus. carbon, the red dot is an oxygen. What that is is a carbonyl group. So it's this thing right here. So that's what we're looking at. And here it is, this little dashed line here, this white ball, that's a hydrogen. That blue ball is a nitrogen. 
this is a hydrogen bond. Okay? So now these two things are attracted to each other. So they're pulling close into each other. But don't forget, just like the people in the front here, how they were connected, he's connected to somebody too. So the peptide chain goes that way. And eventually what will happen is, if you will, follow along. The peptide chain runs this way, then it circles and comes back onto itself this way, then it circles and comes back around this way, and it does this, and then it'll do it again. Until you get what's called a break, or an amino acid breaker, which causes the, the chain, instead of doing the little loop-de-loop, -loop, to go off to a different direction. Certain amino acids will do that, like proline, for example, does that. Don't worry about that. Sorry. I get excited about stuff. All right, so for there, we'll just leave it for now. Come back in 10 minutes. So it's uh, 10.29. See you in 10 minutes. Please, if you would, come and pick up your quizzes. For every quiz I have remaining, I'll take the points on the quiz off of your final grade. I just made that rule up, by the way. So please come get your quizzes, in other words.
Helixes are not that interesting. It's just, shh, thank you. It's just more helices interwoven onto themselves. It's like braiding hair, if you will. If you braid someone's hair, their hair becomes really strong. So these types of things, triple helices, are like collagen, uh, collagen cartilage, connective tissue to your skin, things like that. That's made up of triple helices. Drop those two points down real quick so we can move on. To the immensely more interesting thing, Protein structure. Seriously, it doesn't work for you. But you do have to know this stuff. Simply because it's, it's around. And you know, biology and biochemistry depend upon it. Tertiary structures. We had primary, secondary, and now we're at the tertiary type of structure. Now, primary was just the sequence from left to right. Secondary was what the backbone will do. Tertiary is what the R groups will do. Okay? So, one more time. Primary is the sequence of amino acids from left to right. Secondary structure is what the amide bonds do. So, the little carbon. <clears throat> oxygen double bond and the nitrogen hydrogen nitrogen hydrogen bond, how they'll interact and intertwine with one another. That's secondary. Now tertiary is due to the R groups. So the little side chains that are hanging off. That's what tertiary structure is the result of. Now look at this 
kind of odd shaped thing. That is a ribbon structure of a protein. Now what they mean by a ribbon structure is they usually don't put in any uh, accoutrement, like all the little side chains that you see here. They're usually not drawn in. Usually it's just a, like a, appears to be a ribbon. It just wraps itself through space. What that's showing you is the three-dimensional tertiary structure of a protein. Now, a few things we can pick out here. We're going to go over them a little bit more in a minute. We have over here on the right-hand corner, it says hydrophobic interaction. We have a bunch of carbons and hydrogens that are interacting with one another. It's called a hydrophobic interaction. They love each other. They don't like water. So they find each other. The protein will turn so that these R groups can find each other and start to intermingle. Over on the left side, we have hydrogen bonding. Now, in beta pleated sheets and alpha helixes, it was the backbone, the, arc, the uh, peptide backbone, the scaffolding that was hydrogen bonding to itself. Here, the second, the tertiary structure is the side chains, the R groups that are hydrogen bonding. So now, take a look at these little curly cues here on the right. We have a curly cue going up and a curly cue coming down. Those are alpha helices. But they're held in close proximity by a hydrogen bond. And oh, up there, a salt bridge like we showed you down here on the bottom, a salt bridge. These things are all designed to hold proteins and enzymes in a certain conformation. If you don't hold them in a certain conformation, you lose their effects, okay? And here's a beta pleated sheet, and there's a couple of disulfide bonds. We're gonna get into all that. But I just wanted to give you a feel for what you were looking at. Now, for the next couple of slides, just write down the bold. Do not attempt to write down the non-bolded stuff because I'm going to go too fast over it. Hydrophobic interactions are interactions between two nonpolar R groups. Hydrophobic interactions. Interactions between two nonpolar groups. Just like so. Just like a lipid bilayer. The fatty parts or the hydrophobic parts get into each other, start to mingle, do their thing. That's a hydrophobic interaction. Hydrophilic interactions interactions with water. So the side chain is hanging out, finds that he's stuck in the middle of a hydrophobic environment where there's a bunch of carbons and hydrogens, and the hydrophilic part is like, I don't like this. So the protein will actually turn to allow the R group to stick out into the water of the solution that it's stuck in, for example. Okay? It will also like to interact with other hydrophilic R groups to do hydrogen bonding. Okay? So hydrophobic, hydrophilic. If you hate water, you don't want to be involved with the environment, you're going to wrap yourself into the protein so you can get away, with, away from it. If you're hydrophilic, you're probably going to wrap yourself towards the water. Thank you. Please, I want to give you a second. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Hopefully it's just allergies. So hydrophobic, hydrophilic. Hydrophobic, water-hating interactions. Hydrophilic, water-loving interactions. Try to remember that enzymes are dissolved in water. So hydrophilic means it's going to turn towards the water. The, the R groups will move to associate with the environment. The nonpolar groups will turn away from the water environment. Try to remember that. Okay, it might help you to understand what's happening. All right, so there's the first two. Now, write the bolt down for these three, please. Just, just the bolt. Salt bridges. We talked about that already. When an acid and a base from the R groups find each other, the base will deprotonate the acid, and then you'll have an ionic bond. So it's an ionic bond in the middle of a protein, holding it together. So they're attracted. So they're like, hey, I'm not going far from you because you're positive and I'm negative. And we are attracted to one another because of that. And because of this interaction that we're having, there are the amino acids that are attached to her and the amino acids that are attached to me are held in a rigid pattern because we're causing it to be rigid because we're like so, you know, cool with each other, if you will. What else we got? Hydrogen bonds. Well, that hydrogen bonds. I, I'm going to say this because it's almost always true. If on a multiple choice section of the exam, now if you know that if you know the answer and you know the answer is not hydrogen bonding, don't pick hydrogen bonding. But on the multiple choice section, if you're writing a question and you just flat out don't know the answer and hydrogen bonding is one of your choices, pick hydrogen bonding. If you flat out don't know. Now if you know, and you know the answer is not hydrogen bonding, don't pick it. 
But if you just don't know, like I have no idea, but hydrogen bonding is here, I'll just guess hydrogen bonding. It's usually right. Because hydrogen bonding is such a big player in proteins and peptides. So if you're just going to flat out guess, flat out guess hydrogen bond. If you already know the answer and you know the answer is not hydrogen bonds, by all means don't pick it. Okay? Alright. Hydrogen bonds between the R groups is a big deal. Now we had the salt bridge here, right? We could have easily had hydrogen bonds here too. Hydrogen bonds are a big deal. Let's say that we're going to hydrogen bond together. She likes my delta negative, I like her delta positive, and we kind of just mingle. Like, hey. She tries to get away, but she's so attracted to me that she can't. I try to get away, I'm so attracted to her that I can't. So we're kind of held, I don't want to say rigid, because it's not going to be inflexible, but we really don't want to leave each other. You'd have to put a lot of energy into us to make us want to get off the couch or stop watching House on TV. Sorry. House is a cool show, I just started watching it the other day. Okay. I like this smart ass attitude kind of reminds me of me at one time in my life. Anyway, okay, so let's hide your body. Now, the cool one, the last one, disulfides. Now we're talking cool. The first four interactions we talked about were not covalent. They're not covalent. This one, disulfide bridges, are covalent. So that is held rigid. Feel me for a second? Now, again, me and my little partner here. Hydrogen bonding, we're just attracted to each other. Salt bridges, we're attracted to each other. Hydrophobic interactions, we're kind of intermingling with each other. Hydrophobic inter hydrophilic interaction, again, we're still mingling, but we're not connected. Go ahead, your hand for a second. I know you're writing. Now, disulfide. I'm a sulfur, she's a sulfur. We are physically connected now. I'm not letting go, and she's not letting go. Why? Because we need the we need the electron. So if you heat us up, we just kind of pull tighter. You cool us down, we get closer. You heat us up, cool us down, heat us up. We're not going to break. We're physically connected. How do you break us up? Chemically, exactly. If you hit us with the right chemical, we're like, ah! We can't hold on to each other anymore. If you hit us with the right chemical. Now, if you hit us, if we're not connected, let's say, let's say we're just kind of hanging out. If we're not connected and you give us the right chemical, we'll connect. If you give us the right chemical. That's called getting a perm in your hair. <laughs> That's how you get perms. Perms are uh, usually disulfide bonds in your hair. Okay? So when someone gets a perm, they get the disulfide bonds get made, and when they get their hair relaxed, they get broken chemically. Neat, huh? Okay? Not always. Sometimes hair is curly because of other reasons, but usually it's a disulfide bond. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. So disulfide bond is the only covalent interaction in tertiary structures. Okay? Now obviously amide bonds, you make peptide bonds, those are covalent. But we're talking about tertiary structure, the disulfide bond is your only covalent structure. Okay? And that's a very strong bond. It can be broken chemically, but it's a very strong bond. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Everybody? Yes. Yeah. Alright, let's give this something more interesting. Globular protein. Please write this stuff down. It's kind of, it's kind of sort of important. Globular protein. They're small, they have a spherical shape, they do all kinds of stuff, synthesis, transport, metabolism, blah, blah, blah. And myoglobin is an example, transports oxygen to the muscle, blah, 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 blah. You already know that stuff. So it's just kind of stuff you got to write down and know. There might be one or two multiple choices on that. Might not be any. That's how I feel that day. Okay, so globular proteins, compact and spherical in shape. That's the basis of them. The ribbon structure is kind of cool. You know, it has like a bunch of alpha helices running around there. At least I think it's cool. You may not.
the primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure. Talked a little bit about globular proteins. And now there's one more, quaternary structure. And we're going to get to that here in a second. I can still see people writing a little bit. Everybody done? Yes. Oh, cool. Globular or quaternary structures. Quaternary structures are cool. They're just fabulously cool. Now, I say it like that because I want you guys to understand this now. Quaternary structures are basically four, oh, I'm sorry, not four, more than one combinations of two protein units. So two proteins that are not connected physically, like, like not covalently bonded, will interact with each other. They'll kind of come, come together and go, hello, how you doing? And they'll actually fit together. You tell me that's not cool. Here's an example. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin consists of four separate polypeptide chains. And they kind of just find each other in solution and will kind of amalgamate themselves together to do a function. What? That's amazing. They found each other in solution and kind of just fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Randomly almost. It's not quite randomly, but you know what I mean. That's cool, man. That's cool. You can see the ribbon structure here. You can see the blue and the red uh, polypeptide chains kind of fitting together. And when they do that, they stabilize each other. They make each other a little bit more soluble in water, for example, let's just say. Or they make each other a little bit more resistant to heat, or cold, or acid or base. You know, they help to stabilize one another. That's wicked cool. At least I think so. So you have primary which is the amino acid sequence from left to right, from the amino side to the C-terminal side. Secondary, which are the interactions between the peptide backbone, not the R groups, the backbone, the amide bonds. Tertiary structure, which is the interaction of the side chains of the amino acids. Hydrogen bonding, disulfide bonding, salt bridging, da 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 And now quaternary structure, which is the interaction of one or more, uh, two or more polypeptide chains that are not physically connected, they kind of, but they do interact. That's wild. That's crazy talk. That's biochemistry. Okay? Biochemistry gets very, very complicated because of stuff like this. All right, that's kind of neat. Let's get into something even more fun. Cocaine. Write down denaturation for me. And put into a, a parentheses, cocaine. For now. So I had you write cooking beside the word denaturing. Because when you cook your food, you denature it. Especially, well, proteins. Things like meat, fish, milk. You denature it. So now, what I mean, what I, what I mean by denature, when you have a peptide or an enzyme or a protein, and we talked about all these different three-dimensional structures before tertiary structure to quaternary structure. We talked about all that stuff. And it's a three-dimensional thing. Now, we didn't really talk about why it would do that, so let's talk about that now. Why would a protein want to fold onto itself? That seems like a lot of energy and a lot of time wasted. Why would it fold onto itself? Consider this, consider this. And I told you already before, but amino acids aren't soluble in water. They're usually insoluble in water, right? We said to that at the very beginning of class. As you build a protein, as you build, if you make one synthetically in the lab, they become less and less soluble in water as you make them bigger and bigger and bigger. But yet, enzymes are soluble in water, which is a good thing. Enzymes and proteins are mostly soluble in water because we're in water, right? So we kind of want our chemicals to be dissolved in water so we can actually do something with them. Does that make a little bit of sense? So now, enzymes, because they're huge, shouldn't be soluble in water. But they are. Hmm. That's why they fold. So now, imagine you had a whole bunch of amino acids attached to each other, and all of their R groups are hydrophobic. Well, that's not going to dissolve in water now, is it? But what if it turned? What if it turned on to itself so all the R groups are pointing towards themselves and all the amide bonds are pointing towards the water? That would be soluble because the water can interact with the amide bonds. The hydrophobic things are like, ooh, we're kind of snug now. 
Kind of like soap, right? Remember we did that whole thing with soap? Kind of like that. So that's called nature. Nature. When a protein is wrapped up in soluble in water, it's called nature. Doesn't, I mean, I say soluble in water. It doesn't have to be soluble in water, which we'll get to in a minute. But usually that's what it is. Take, for example, egg white. Egg white is the best example of a nature protein. If you have an egg and you crack it open, you put it in a glass and you look at it, you see a beautiful yellow yolk and clear solution or clear slimy fluid, right? It's mostly water, but in that, that egg clear slimy fluid, what makes it slimy is protein. It's called albumin. There's a protein in that egg white. What the protein's for is for the little developing egg uh, chicken to feed on when it's, as it's growing. So now we as humans exploit that and we eat it ourselves, right? So now when you take an egg, crack it, put it in the frying pan, immediately, as long as the frying pan is hot, immediately the protein in the egg white starts to turn white. And it's no longer slimy, it's kind of fl uh, flaky and velvety and delicious. With a little bit of garlic and salt, right? What's happening at that point is the protein that was soluble in water got some heat. The heat caused all those little interactions, the hydrogen bonding, the salt bridging, all those things that are weak interactions that gave them enough energy to break apart. Are you with me so far? So here we are. Ooh, we're having Fritos. Oh, no, no, we're, not, we're not covalent. We're just interacting. She's positive, I'm negative. So we're just kind of interacting. But now we crank up the heat a little bit. So now we start to get more kinetic energy. There you go. And eventually our kinetic energy draws us apart, right? And as we're drawn apart, water comes between us. Now, no, we don't want to go. And the further and further apart we get, you can't swim against the current though, I'm sorry. The further and further apart we get, the more we start to interact with water because we need to be stabilized. So I'm, she's positive, I'm still native. So we're interacting with water now. Now the proteins that were on either, the amino acids that were on either side of us, now they're free to move. So instead of us holding them more or less rigid, now they're free to move and they'll unravel. And as they unravel, they become less and less soluble in water. Okay? That's why the egg white turns to a basically a solid. Right? That's heating a protein. So you heat a protein, they turn into a solid. Well, they denature, become less soluble in water. What's another cool protein in our life? Milk. Right? People say eat milk because it's got a lot of protein. Or drink milk it has a lot of protein in it. Protein's called casein. Now we all know if you drink orange juice and then drink milk, you get a stomach ache. Right? Is there a mix orange? Don't do it. It makes you feel really sick. Now, take a little bit of orange juice, a little bit. No, don't use the whole gallon because, you know, I guess we're all adults here. If you're not an adult, don't take all your mom's orange juice, she'll kill you. Take an orange juice, take a little bit in the glass, take a little, maybe a quarter inch, and pour a quarter inch of milk on top of it, swirl it. What happens? The milk curdles. You get curdled. Okay? The milk will start to form little chunks, which is why you feel sick when you drink it. Okay? Because it fills your stomach up. The milk curdle. That milk curdle is the protein called casein. Okay? So that's milk casein, milk protein. Orange juice is acidic, right? So you're mixing an acid with a protein. Acids denature proteins. Okay, that's one of the points on here. Acids and bases break down hydrogen, hydrogen bonds between polar R groups. Okay? So mix any kind of protein with an acid, you'll get denaturation. It'll go from being a, um, say, say it's dissolved in water, it'll go from being dissolved in water to being insoluble in water, just by adding acid or base. Okay? So if you try that one at home, that was simple. Take a little but, bit of milk, add some vinegar, do the same thing. But with spoiled uh, milk, it's yep. also curved. Yeah, the bacteria in the milk are changing the, the pH of the milk to acid. The pH so becomes acidic and yep. then the and same stinky and tastes happen. like crap. Yep. Mm -hmm. Also, the, the bacteria are probably breaking down the proteins too, so they're probably eating the protein. Okay. And that causes a breakdown as well. A couple things are happening there. Good question, by the way. Heavy metal ions. <laughs> I like this one. So here's what you do. You take some of your milk before you curdle it, you put it in front of your stereo and crank up some death metal, like, you know, metallic or something. 
the heavy metal will <laughs> one person, two, three, and the rest of y'all, oh, four, and nobody else is so funny. Okay. I love that joke. No one ever lost that. What Nothing. Heavy metal, you know, the music's going on. You know, that kind of crap. Basically, don't do this at home. It's actually dangerous. You take a heavy metal like silver, uh, not, not, still, not your mom's silverware, but silver ions like silver nitrate. Uh, mercury salts will do this. Don't, don't do this. Don't do this at home. Um, any kind of uh, heavy metal ion will break apart the isulfides off. So when you go on to the, get a hairstyle, the hairstylist will give you a perm and they'll use, I, think, I believe they actually use heavy metals to relax your hair. So they use heavy metals to do that, uh, which is why whenever you see your hairstylist do that, she usually, I hope, wears gloves because it is somewhat dangerous. On your hair, the concentrations are quite low. So as long as you don't drink it, you'll be fine. But you should uh, be very careful about the drinking. Oh, agitation. I'll try it out. Try it out. Agitation. Now, we've all had lemon meringue pie, have we not? Everyone has someone in their family that always makes lemon meringue pie because it's really hard to make and not everyone can do it. So, what do you do when you make lemon meringue pie? Or even whipped cream, for example. Is that, have anyone, has anyone actually made real whipped cream, like not from a can? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do? You whip it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you whip it for a good long time, right? Yeah. You're agitating the protein. So what happens when you're agitating something? Well, again, let's, my friend and I here will do our little interaction. We're interacting. Now remember, we're not rigid. We're, we're fluid. We still move in the liquid. We're fluid. So as you beat us up, as you're moving us around, we're still fluid. So now you can kind of whip us, and we're kind of breaking apart now because you're moving us a lot faster. And then water can get between us again, and we can separate like that. So when you make lemon meringue or whipped cream, you're denaturing the protein, making it a solid. Now in whipped cream and lemon meringue, it doesn't last forever because you're not completely denaturing the protein. You're just getting to a certain point. You ever, when you make lemon meringue, they talk about the peaks. Right? One one person, oh, two people cook. You know, you, you, you can't pull do it with and egg too. do it with eggs too, exactly. Same same thing, protein. You whip, 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 pull, it makes those little peaks. Yeah. As long as your peaks are what, an inch and a half or two inches tall, it's ready to go. <laughs> now those peaks don't last forever. They kind of break down after a couple of hours. But in that sweet spot, that two hour period, it's delicious. Okay? okay? But that's the denature protein. Okay? That's what you're doing, you're agitating it. Is it still considered denatured? Like, if you were like over with it, like I know when you over with whipped yep. cream, it just breaks apart. It just yep, you're going you're going to the other side. Yeah, the that's, the, that's another sort of denaturation. Yeah. So it would still be considered denatured. Yes, yeah, so that's the denaturing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with over whipping. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously though, it's, it's frustrating. You do all this, and then, it's, then you're like starting again. But anyway. Uh, oh yes, one thing we should talk about real quick. Um, uh, save, uh, not ceviche? Ceviche. ceviche, fish and lemon juice, right? Yeah. That's called chemical cooking. So you take fish, squeeze on the lemon juice, and you can you can actually watch the fish protein cook, right? Quote unquote. You're not using heat; you're using acidity to denature the protein in the fish, right? I never knew that. It's cool, right? You should yeah. try it. It's actually very good. Raw fish? Yeah, it's raw, right? Yeah, it's raw. Yeah, and then they squeeze lemon juice, or they or you squeeze it's, lemon it's juice. It's safe? Yeah. Well, you can eat fish raw, sushi. Just, you know, don't let it sit in your fridge for two or three days. Mm -hmm. Just buy it fresh and use it right out. Hmm? You can eat a lot of things raw that's safe. Now, the FDA is going to say we don't recommend it. And they can eat chicken raw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not. It's, you're at a high risk of getting a, uh, ill, but you mm -hmm. still can eat it raw. You can eat anything raw if you want to. It's all about risk, you know. But there's no risk to eating raw fish, right? Yeah, there's risk. There's no, I'm mean, eating the way you're saying. That's no. Well, there's risk. Like there's the there's always the risk. Whatever you eat, there's always risk. It depends on whether the risk is 1.2 percent or 99.5 percent. You know, it all depends. You know, if the milk's been in your fridge for six months and you drink it, you probably you may not get sick, but you probably will. You know what I mean? If the milk came from the cow and it's only been in your fridge for a day, you probably won't get sick, but you still might. See what I'm saying? It's all about risk. All the risk reward. Is the risk of eating some HA worth the reward of how good it tastes? Yeah. I think so, yeah. I'd you do it. You just drown it in there, man? You just drown it in there, man? 
doesn't matter that the bacteria may or may not have killed at that point. You don't know. You never know. But the same uh, I love that look at a student the first time they realize that their whole life is about chance. <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> yeah, seriously, you can go hang out with a bunch of people with like leprosy, and you may or may not get it. There's always there's, there's a chance that you won't get it. Well, there's a good chance that you will. Oh, it's contagious? Leprosy? Yeah. yeah. But most people don't have leprosy anymore. It's very odd. In third world countries, they sometimes see it, but not very often, even there. You do beef jerky. You're doing the same thing. No? Beef jerky is very similar, but beef jerky is safer because it's dry. When there's no water, bacteria can't propagate. So you put lemon on beef jerky? That's how it's No, they dry it. They dry it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's fine. No, beef jerky is just dried meat. Oh, okay. And with spices. So, and the beef jerky has so many preservatives in it that most things won't grow. Oh, okay. I'm about to say, if you let meat stay out dry in the sun. Oh, great question, but this is a whole, this is microbiology now. I forget everything we're going to say. Okay. Food preservation has to do with uh, one or two ways to do it. You can chemically preserve it, or you can dry it. So if you dry food, you take away the water, then it can't rot. It can't grow fungus. It can't grow bacteria because there's not enough water. How would you dry that quickly? No one ever. We can that. Class is not that hard. Okay. I've, I've done it. It's really simple. You done it? Yeah. You ate it? Yeah. I'm still here. <laughs> I used to be six feet tall. <laughs> All right, let's go over enzymes and enzyme action. Now, we've learned all this stuff about proteins and peptides, at least I think, so we can talk about enzymes. Because enzymes are the workforces of our body. They do all the chemistry, for the most part. Okay? Now, if you look at the screen here, you will see a little gray blob called the enzyme. Then you have this blue and green thing that somehow finds its way into the enzyme. And then there's a weird thing here called an active site. And then there's products. There's some kind of mysterious thing going on here. It's not at all mysterious. It's very, actually very elegant. But what happens now is say you have this blue and green thing. The blue and green thing is called a substrate. Substrate's a fancy word for starting material, or what the enzyme's going to work on. So it's called a substrate. It will bind to the enzyme, and it will bind to what's called the active site. The active site just means this is where the activity is going to be. It's going to be something chemically happen here. And then it throws out products. So you go substrate to products through an enzyme. Now, let's break all this down, please. Enzymes are proteins that catalyze nearly, not all, but nearly all, of the chemical reactions taking place in our body. <coughs> okay. Now, they increase the rate of reaction by lowering the energy of activation. Remember all that stuff? Energy of activation, we talked about that? The little curves. And catalysts can lower the activation energy. Well, enzymes are biological catalysts. Okay? They lower the activation energy of a reaction. Therefore, by lowering the energy it takes to make a reaction go forward, the reactions by default will happen faster. Okay? That's what catalysts do. They make reactions that normally wouldn't happen, happen fast. Which is cool, because we need them to make energy and stuff like that. Don't worry about the bottom point. Just write the first two points, please. Now, enzymes are interesting. They're also the target of a lot of drugs. So a lot of the drugs we take, not all of them, but a lot of them, target enzymes. They try to inhibit enzyme interaction. They try to prevent enzymes from doing it. Because maybe they're overactive. Maybe they're doing too much, causing harm. We're hoping that I have. Or I'm hoping that I have. Not, not, not the flu. All right. Thank you. Keep it. Keep it real. Say it again. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of pollen in the area now. Yeah, I okay, just good. I just had that problem with the sinusitis. So I'm not as oh, about it. Yeah, they said it's high. I hope that's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> Take some Zyrtec. I'm good. All right. Let's move on to the interesting stuff. The active site. Write this down for me, please. The active site is a region within the enzyme that fits the shape of the substrate.
contains amino acid R groups. Release this products when complete. So now, as you're writing that down, I'll just let, uh, kind of draw you a mental picture. Imagine just a blob, just a big blob. And in that blob is a little indentation. Just an indent. Just a little cutout, if you will. Imagine you throw in a bunch of substrate or anything. Just imagine you throw, say, a bunch of baseballs at it. Let's say the blob is big enough to accommodate a basketball. So you throw baseballs at it. The baseballs can land inside of that little cutout you've made. They can get in there, but they're too small to do anything with, so they just kind of go back out. Are you with me on that? Big old blob, cut out a little indent, big enough for a basketball. You throw a bunch of baseballs at it. They're too small. The blob can't hold on to them. They just kind of come back out. You throw golf balls at it. Smaller. Oh, the, the, they just kind of fall in the little, little cutout, and then they kind of jump back out because it's too small to do anything with. Then you throw beach balls at it. And the blob's there, the little indent, the little cutout. The beach balls kind of bounce off of it because they can't get into it. They're too big. And then you throw basketballs at it. And the basketballs fit perfectly in that little indent. They fit perfect. The, ends on, uh, the little blob can hold on to them. They can't escape. They fit perfectly in that little indent in that blob. Now, the enzyme is the blob. The basketball is the substrate. The cutout is the active site where the magic's going to happen. Now the enzyme can actually hold on to the substrate. That's the first thing. The enzyme has to be able to hold the substrate steady. Imagine you're trying to hit a nail with a hammer. So you have a piece of board and a nail in it, and you're trying to hit that nail with a hammer. Now imagine someone's moving the board. How many times are you going to hit the nail? Not very often, right? Now imagine the board is held steady. Every time you'll probably hit the nail, right? You may not hit it square, but you're going to hit it. Enzymes are the same way. Inside of the active site of an enzyme, there is a hammer. It's some kind of amino acid artery. It's hammering away. If the substrate, say a golf ball comes in, the enzyme is trying to hit it, but the golf ball is moving. It's not being held rigid, so the enzyme is trying to hit a moving target. Can't. So eventually the golf ball just flutters away. Now the basketball comes in, boom, it's held right there. And the active site is going to hit it, boom, right at the sweet spot every time. Boom, boom, boom. Now remember when we talked about how reactions work. Molecules have to find each other, right? And they have to hit each other in the right way. Is that, is that correct? Mm -hmm. An enzyme is designed to grab the substrate, position it in the exact right way, so that when the, when the reactive reaction happens, they're hitting each other at exactly the right angle, at exactly the right time, with enough energy to make it happen. So you eliminate all the randomness that the reaction has to go through, right? You said enzymes share that? Enzymes will hold it and hold it steady and hold it at the right angle and the active site can act on it. That's why only certain enzymes will do certain reactions. Okay? So like the glycosidase only can react with glucose, for example, or, or some kind of sugar. That's why enzymes that are designed to do oxidation can't do reductions. See what I'm saying? Okay? Enzymes will grab onto the substrate, will hold it, right orientation at the right angle so the chemical reactivity can happen. Now, you can write all this down, but don't try to draw it. It's, way, it's actually way too much. What that's trying to show you, that little drawing on the side there, is it's trying to show you that inside the active site, there's many different ways you can hold the substrate steady. You have yourself on one side, a bunch of hydrophobic amino acids. And if your substrate, say the basketball, has a little hydrophobic patch on it, the basketball is going to turn so its hydrophobic part and the hydrophobic part of the enzyme are kind of matched up because they want to dissolve into each other. If you can hydrogen bond, they're going to hydrogen bond too. This is how the enzyme will hold things steady, hold them square. Okay? Also, notice none of these interactions are covalent. They're all just interactions. They're all just kind of like being attracted, but they're not physically connected. 
So that means as the basketball lands into the, to the cutout that we made, it can hang out there for a little while and then leave. It doesn't have to stay there. It's just being held a little bit more rigid than normal. Okay? So imagine that you know someone's moving that little plank with the nail in it, and as it gets in front of you, they slow it down so you can hit it. Okay? And then the board's just gonna keep moving. Alright? Everyone kind of okay with that? Mm -hmm. So whatever the enzyme reacts on, it does not covalently bond to it. Are you with me? Everybody a little bit? Alright. Now. The enzyme is used over and over. The enzyme can do this, whatever reaction is doing, say it's nailing a, putting a nail into a board, it can do that thousands of times. Thousands and thousands of times. Just wham, wham, wham. And because it's doing the same thing, well, I won't say that, it's not actually true, it's just kind of funny. I don't want to confuse you. It's doing the same thing over and over and over again. That's called, you might hear this word, it's called enzyme turnover. Enzyme can keep doing the same thing over and over again. Okay? You said um, enzyme react but not form a covalent bond? No. So who do you say enzyme? Oh, uh, you would agree with okay. They're just interactions. Okay. Write down lock and key model. Very common model for enzymes. Think about your key to your house. Think about the lock that's on your door. The enzyme is the lock. The substrate is the key. When the key docks to the door lock in your door, they match perfectly, at least you hope so. If they match perfectly, a reaction can occur. You can turn the door. If they don't match perfectly, at least you hope so, nothing will happen. Just to try to move the key and it won't move and eventually you'll break the key off in the lock. Keep trying. Okay? So that's the lock and key model. The lock is rigid. The key is rigid. One has to fit the other one perfectly. You can't make the lock fit the key. Right? The lock either fits the key or it doesn't. Right? Right. Two people agree that they're no locks. That's how they work. Okay. My key to my house probably will not open your key to your house. What will it? Mm -hmm. Probably not, right? So... Your enzyme on your door and my substrate won't work together because it's a rigid model. I can't, you can't just take any old key and open any old door. Okay? Locks are rigid, so are keys. It's called a lock and key model where the enzyme, the active site, and the substrate are designed specifically for one another. And the enzyme is rigid. It won't change for anything. So if you don't fit exactly what it's looking for, it will throw you back out without reacting on you. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I like the basketball, the basketball and the little cutout we made on our blog. The basketball fit perfectly, but the baseballs didn't. The beach balls don't. The enzyme did not try to accommodate those, it just rejected them. Put them out, right? That's lock and key model of enzyme interaction. Now, that implies, since it's a lock and key model, it implies there must be a different kind of model. Where the lock is not rigid, it's more flexible. Are you with me on that? Mm -hmm. Kind of implies that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So one's rigid. There must be an example of flexible enzyme. And there is. It's called the induced fit model. You guys all got that written down? Mm -hmm. Induced fit model. Now the induced fit model, the enzyme is not considered to be rigid. It's more flexible in the way it can do things. In the business, we actually call that a promiscuous enzyme. <laughs> It makes us all giggle too. But if you read the chemical literature, it's written that. It's what we call them. They can accommodate numerous types of substrates. Now, you can't, you know, take a golf ball and put it where the basketball was, but you can take a small basketball and put it in there, or a larger basketball and put it in there. The enzyme will, will kind of, you know, expand and contract around it. But you can't go too different. You can only go slightly different. You know what I'm saying? Does that make a little more sense? Mm -hmm. So, for example, an enzyme that's designed to react with sugars probably won't react with proteins. Okay? An enzyme that's designed to work on DNA probably won't do much with carbohydrates. Okay? But one that's designed for DNA could react at numerous sites along the DNA, not just a specific one. Okay? So there's two types of enzymes. Induced fit and rigid uh, lock and key. The bottom example is pretty neat. 
Shape changes improve catalytic reaction. So now, imagine again, you're trying to hammer the nail into the board, and the, the board comes to you, and it's not quite the right style, like it's maybe off by a fraction of an inch. So instead of moving the board, the enzyme will move, change its shape to accommodate the reaction. So enzymes can do that. They're not, when we think of them, we draw them as rigid, static things that aren't really moving. When the reality is, they're moving all the time. They're flexing, they're contracting, they're, you know, the you know, there's water everywhere that's moving them around. They're moving all the time, okay? Which is why it's so important for the enzyme, when it docks to something, to hold it still. So the enzyme can react to it, all right? If it can't bind the thing into the substrate factor site, it can't react to it. That's the first thing, which is so really cool. I wish we had more time to talk about something like this, because this is actually very cool. Um, can you compare that to a little kid at a doctor? You have to hold the little kid down. The so you can stick with the needle. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's kind of like the same thing. Only more violent than the board and the nail. <laughs> OK. Hold with me, guys. We're almost done. 20 minutes. I know. You can do it. And look around you. Most people fail on us today. You should. You should. All right, write this down. Factors affecting enzyme activity. Well, you might get a script if I tell you what's going to be on the exam. Like if I say, this will probably be on the exam. You know, especially the multiple choice section. All right. So now we have enzymes, right? We have enzymes. They have active sites, things bind to them, boom, a chemical reaction occurs. Now, we've also learned that enzymes are biological catalysts. So they make reactions in the body happen fast. Okay? So a reaction that might, over a course of a year, take place, an enzyme can do it in the course of a moment, just a single fraction of time. But there are things that affect it. Now, this picture here is really cool. This is a hot spring, I believe, somewhere. And you can see all this kind of red stuff happening here. That red stuff is some kind of biological thing, probably a fungus or an algae. It survives in extreme heat. There are, there are creatures at the bottom of the ocean that live off of hot vents, little steam vents at the bottom of the ocean that are like hundreds of degrees. They live there. So their enzymes and their little bodies are designed to withstand extreme heat. You take a human being, Put them beside extreme heat or in an extreme heat environment, they won't last long. We can't be too hot or we die. Because our enzymes start to denature, which is not a good thing. But some animals, some creatures can handle it, which is, I think is pretty cool. All right. Enzymes are most active at the optimum temperature of 37 degrees. Now that's in humans. Our optimum activity is at 37 degrees. So we keep our enzymes at a steady baking temperature of 37. Sometimes we get a little hot, sometimes we get a little cold, but for the most part, 37 degrees. Now, if you take our enzymes and you cool them down, they react slower. If you cool them down enough, they don't react at all. Kind of like a chemical reaction, right? We all know that. If you cool a chemical reaction down, the reaction goes slower, generally. Okay. So now an enzyme, if you heat it up, according to what we already know about chemical reactions, the reaction should go faster, right? Mm -hmm. And it will for a period of time. However, if you heat it up too much, you lose all activity. Why? Because the enzyme denatures. Remember, enzymes are folded up in a certain way to have the active site built around the substrate. If you heat it up too much, you break up all of its hydrogen bonding interactions and it will denature, just like egg albumin will do that in the frying pan. So you can't heat up a protein or an enzyme too much, or else it will unravel and lose all catalytic function. All right? That's where there's a sweet spot. 37 degrees is where you want to be for a human being. Okay? So temperature plays a big role in enzyme activity. 37 degrees for humans. But not all enzymes are 37. Again, some animals live in the hot springs. Their enzymes can be a lot hotter than that, and they still function, which is really cool if you ask me. Oh, 
Okay. How is everyone doing so far? I know it's a lot of stuff to cover in one class, and I'm sorry, but unfortunately we had that uh, two days off. Uh, now we're paying for it. All right. Enzymes, pH. Now, we've already learned, we've already learned that if you take an enzyme or a protein and throw acid on it, the protein will denature. Think of I like thinking about that. It actually makes me hungry. Anyway, base will also do the same thing. So if you increase the pH too much, the protein will denature. If you decrease the pH too much, the protein will denature. So there's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. Now, a lot of human enzymes, right around seven, is our sweet spot. But there's some enzymes in our body that really do like it to be more acidic. There's some enzymes that prefer to be a little more basic. It all depends on the enzyme. Okay? But just know that the enzymes have a specific pH where they're most active. A little too acidic, they start to denature, they lose activity. A little too basic, they lose activity, start to denature. All right? So heat and pH matter to the enzyme. Heat and pH. So far, so good, right? I think that's pretty cool. Heat and pH. And the next slide I'm going to show you when you're all done writing that, I'm just going to show you that some enzymes in our body, you don't have to write it down, and what pH they really like to be in. And it is kind of dramatic when you see it. Everybody got it? No. No. Do you have it up? One more second. One. Have it up? Yes. <laughs> Still see it, right? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Don't write this down. Just take a look at this table with me. On the left, there's a series of enzymes. So let's look at the first one, pepsin. Pepsin is in your stomach. It dissolves or reacts with peptide bonds. So it likes to break down amino acids. Look at the pH. It's optimum at. Optimum pH, 1.5 to 2. Highly acidic. It loves to be acidic. It's designed to work in your stomach, which would make sense then why it likes strong, uh, low pH. Because your stomach's basically a big pool of HCl. So it loves to be acidic. But now on the other side of that, argininease works in your liver. Targets uh, arginine for uh, destruction. pH 9.7, almost pH 10. Highly basic. Isn't that neat? Some enzymes love it to be really basic. Some love it to be really acidic. It depends on what they're designed to do and where they're designed to do it. Which I think is just fantastically cool. All right. Write this down. Substrate concentration. Now remember the substrate is what the enzyme is going to react with. Now this is neat. Okay. So the rate of reaction increases as the... As the uh, Substrate concentration increases. That's pretty neat. So now, let's look at this little chart um, number uh, A. As we increase the concentration of the enzyme, the reaction rate goes up in a linear fashion. So the more enzyme you have, the, fast, the faster the reaction will go. But now, look at chart B. If we increase the substrate concentration, we increase to a maximum point, and then we plateau. We can't go any faster. Okay, so let's recognize that. If we increase the number of enzymes, the reaction can go infinitely fast. But if we increase the number of substrates, the reaction can only go so fast. Think of it this way. This is how I think of it. Think of the enzyme as a carpenter building a house, which is what the enzyme is doing. There are, there are workers in your body that build stuff that we need. So now the carpenter is in your building a house, and you have all the materials there to build the house. So the one carpenter is going, doing his little job. Now, we increase the number of carpenters. We, instead of having one carpenter, we hire 50 skilled carpenters. They can build the house 50 times faster, can't they? Because they all know what they're doing. Right? Yeah. So that makes sense. If we increase the number of enzymes, the substrate will be consumed faster. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, let's take that one carpenter and instead of increasing the number of carpenters he can work with, let's tell him he's got to build 10 houses. Well, the one guy can only work so fast. You can't, he can't work any faster than he already is, right? 
So asking him to build more houses is not going to make him work any faster. He's already working at his maximum output. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you have an enzyme, you show it more substrate, the enzyme is going to go, I can only do so much so fast, and I'm only going to react this fast. Now give me more carpenters, and we'll react a whole lot faster. But I cannot go faster than I'm, than I'm physically able to do. Does that make sense? Because okay. remember, the enzyme has to dock the protein, has to dock the substrate, react to it, and then kick it back out. All of these things take time. Carpenter's got to measure, cut, place, nail, read, you know, it's going to take time. It takes a lot of time to do stuff. So the more people you have building your home, the faster it gets done. The more enzyme you have reacting on substrate, the faster it gets done. <coughs> Given the enzyme more substrate to react with, to a certain point, the enzyme will work faster, but to a plateau, it will just stop. It'll just keep working at the same rate. It can't physically go any faster. So substrate concentration is a big, big deal. Okay, last topic. Inhibition. Enzyme inhibition. It's a fascinating topic. There's two kinds of inhibitors. They do two different things. What's an inhibitor? First of all, the enzyme is going to dock with the substrate. So the enzyme and the substrate will come together. Basically think of it like on those science fiction movies when the little ship docks to the bigger one. They fly into the active site. The enzyme does some chemistry, throws out products. An inhibitor prevents that. An inhibitor will form what's called an enzyme inhibitor complex. And the inhibitor won't let the substrate dock. It stands guard. It occupies the active site or something else, preventing the substrate from coming in or preventing it from reacting. Okay? That's called the inhibitor enzyme complex. You will not get any product at that point because the enzyme has been effectively neutralized by the inhibitor. Okay? Make some sense? Okay. That's what inhibitors do. They prevent enzyme activity. Now, there's two types, like I said. There's competitive and non-competitive. Competitive and non-competitive. Competitive is very straightforward. Got it? Yep. Everybody got it? Mm-hmm. Competitive. Now, a competitive inhibitor will compete directly with the substrate for the active site. So it's like all of us in this room are trying to sit in this chair. So we're all going to compete with each other to sit in that chair. That's the big thing. We're all going to compete to get there. So we're competitively inhibiting each other. Right? If I'm going to sit here, then one of y'all going to try to bump me out of the chair, then you're going to sit there. So we're competing for it. We're competing for the active site. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So let's say the women here are the substrate, the men are the inhibitors. So the men are going to try to get to this chair before the women. Okay? We're competing with one another for this chair. Make sense? Competitive inhibition, the enzyme. Sorry, the substrate and the inhibitor are competing for the same active site. Now, an inhibitor then, depending on the enzyme, probably resembles a substrate. At least a little bit, right? Remember the whole thing about the blob and the little cutout of the basketballs? In order to inhibit that enzyme, we have to put an inhibitor in the active site that looks kind of sort of like a basketball, but isn't it? Let's say instead of a basketball, it's a medicine ball. A big one. They're both the same size, both the same shape. Walk into the active site. It inhibits the active site. The basketball can no longer get in there because the medicine ball is stuck in there. See what I'm saying? Okay. All right. That's competitive inhibition. Now, non-competitive inhibition, I think, is more interesting to think about because it's weird. It's kind of a little strange. So competitive. The enzyme, sorry, the substrate and the inhibitor are competing for the active site. Non-competitive inhibition, strange. I see people scribbling still, and they are done. All right, good job. Non-competitive inhibition it has a structure that is much different than the substrate, and the bot, this middle point is the key. 
distorts the shape of the enzyme, which alters the shape of the active site. So you don't have to bind to the active site. Now think about an enzyme for a second. What's going on? There's, the enzyme is like a hammer to a nail. It's just hitting that nail. Doing this all day long. Now, you as a human being, you can do this for a good long time. Let's imagine someone comes up behind me and stabs me in the back. I can no longer do it because now there's something stuck in my back. Please don't stab me. Okay? See how that changes things? Or say someone comes up behind me and grabs my left arm and pulls it away. Distorts the shape of my active site. So they're inhibiting my enzymatic process. Now even if substrate came in front of me, a nail came in front of me, you know, I can't hit it. It's not there because it's over here now, right? So that's non-competitive inhibition. It's not competing directly for the active site. It binds somewhere remotely to the active site and distorts the enzyme, makes it change its shape. By changing its shape, the active site completely falls apart, and now the um, substrate reactivity is kind of screwed up. Which is kind of, you know, good, depending on what you're trying to do, or bad, depending on your uh, point of view. Okay, so competitive and non-competitive. Now, the interesting thing, most of our enzymes have natural inhibitors. There's an enzyme called calpane, for example, that's in all of your cells. It has a natural inhibitor that's in your cells too called calpastatin. They're both there. Cal uh, calpane is kind of neat, it's calcium activated. So if you give yourself calcium, the calpane becomes active. But then so does calpane, its inhibitor becomes active as well. So they kind of meet each other in the cell and your cell has a natural way of controlling the activity of, of these enzymes. Because some enzymes, you don't want to be active in your cells until you're ready to kill them off. Because they do, they do a full apoptosis. Okay? So, inhibitors, competitive, non-competitive. But what I didn't tell you is those are what's called reversible. So, for example, someone, I'm trying to, you know, do my little catalytic activity and someone stabs me. That's reversible. They can pull the knife back out I just I can do it again. Okay? Or I have my active site and if someone docks to that and I can't do anything and then the substrate, will, the inhibitor will just leave. It's reversible. Okay? Only non-competitive, right? Uh, competitive or non-competitive, it doesn't matter. Oh. They're both reversible. Okay? So that's a good thing if it's natural. If like it's a natural inhibitor, you know, natural inhibitor will maybe stop you from producing more acid in your stomach or it will trigger you to produce more. Okay? Those are good things. But now in drugs, a lot of drugs, you want to have things that are called irreversible inhibitors. Irreversible inhibitors will make covalent bonds to your active sites or to your or, or remotely from there. Okay? Irreversible inhibitors. These are drugs, usually. A lot of irreversible inhibitors are drugs. For example, penicillin is an irreversible inhibitor. It gets to an enzyme, the enzyme goes, hey, I recognize you. Bam! Hammers the nail. But now, instead of the hammer pulling back to hit the nail again, imagine the hammer got welded to the nail. So now the active site has been effectively destroyed. It's covalently bonded to something. So now all it can do is wave around the inhibitor. Okay? So the active site can't do anything now. The enzyme's still there, but it can't do anything. Because now it's essentially just a protein now, without any catalytic function. Irreversible inhibitor. It cannot let go. Kind of like when you, uh, I don't know, have kids. They just don't let go of you. No matter how much you shake your hand, the little kids will hang on to you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Although they're beautiful, cute little kids, they are inhibiting you. If you're trying to walk faster, they're slowing you down. Why? Because they're children they have small legs. Okay? But that's an irreversible inhibitor. All right? Does that make some sense? All right. Oh, please let that be all of it. Yep, that's it. That is everything I have to tell you about chemistry for this class. And I'm sorry that we had to rush through chapter 16. But again, we did miss two days of lecture uh, for the March break and also for uh, Professional Development Day, which I had obliged to do. But I think we got through it. And I'm going to miss all y'all. <laughs>
in my Friday morning, so I'm going to miss you guys. But hopefully you guys will want to do cool things. Uh, let me know. Just come by and visit or send an email. Let me know how you're doing. Um, can you tell me how you click me? How do you drive me quickly? Yeah, you pass air through it. You just pump air through it. Can you in front of a fan? Yep. There's a guy called Alt Brown. He's a stuff called Canadian. No YouTube. Please pick up your quizzes if you haven't already, guys. Yeah, he does a nice little example of how to make free tricks. Probably a day. Plenty of bonus to make up for the 